catapulting as developed by naval aviators was first used by cruisers and battleships as a means of launching their observation seaplanes to carry out spotting missions. As naval aviation progressed, emphasis was laid on carrier-based aircraft that at certain times needed a means of short, rapid launching. The present-day concealed flush deck catapult is a direct descendant of the earlier open cradle type and is used to launch land planes from a carrier deck. The only part of the catapult visible is the track, with all operating machinery placed athwart ships below the flight deck. By using animation, it is possible to introduce the essentials of a catapulting operation. The white line serves as a guide for taxing planes into the proper launching position on the catapult track. The addition of positioning chocks on the flight deck assists in the speeding up of operations. The right wheel of the plane is stopped by the front wheel chock. The tail wheel strikes the rear wheel chock, aligning the plane properly on the catapult track. The stop chock prevents forward motion of the plane until it is properly attached to the catapult. When the plane reaches the proper position, the hold back and release unit is attached from a fixed socket in the deck. The hook of the holdback unit keeps the plane in position against the full power of the propeller until the catapult is fired. Firing of the catapult breaks the metal tension ring in the holdback unit. The hook swings free, allowing the plane to move down the deck. The bridle or pendant is attached to the catapult hook on the plane and to the shuttle in the track. The bridle catcher is placed at the forward end of the track to catch the bridle as the plane becomes airborne. As the whole back and release unit is attached, the stop chock is removed. Below is the catapult machine, which translates the force of compressed air through a hydraulic cylinder and wire rope linkage to the shuttle. Tension is applied and slack is taken out of the bridle. Proper pressure is exerted on the holdback unit and the plane is ready for launching. The catapult is a reverse hydraulic block and tackle. The movement of the cross head and piston pulls the shuttle down the track by cable. As the catapult is fired, the tension ring is broken, allowing the plane to move freely down the track, carrying the bridle into the bridle catcher as the plane becomes airborne. This carrier is at flight quarters. Plane captains have manned their planes to start and warm up the engine in preparation for launching. Below in the machinery room, the crew readies the catapult by going over the checkoff list thoroughly. And the event launching by catapult is ordered. Shiv three, liquid level OK. Buffers out. Cable tensioner piston in position. Cut off mechanism free. Tension liquid level OK. Tracks clear. Pumps not leaking. Preventer not leaking. Crosshead OK. Supply level OK. Open supply valves. Supply valves open. Preventer pressure up, power on regulators, retraction valve, pull out. 
The flight deck signal light repeater is positioned by the control board operator as he mans his station and prepares to cross-check the panel signal lights with those in the catapult machinery room. Ready. The catapult operator checks the high-pressure air supply. Closes tensioner valve and high-pressure air to the accumulator. Starts number one and number two accumulator motor. Stand by to check signal lights. As this word is passed, he turns on a suspension switch. Presses first ready white light. Answered standby green light from top side. He pulls crosshead safety pin, pushes final ready red light. Fire, signal from catapult control on the flight deck. Safety pin is replaced and the control board lights are blocked out by the suspension switch. After the rocker arm wedge is removed, the firing handle safety lock is replaced by an easily removed safety bolt. Visually rechecking the accumulator liquid level finds it slightly low. So the selector switch is turned to the number one pump. The accumulator is turned on, and he then gives first ready light. This is flashed to control and flight deck repeater. Flight deck standby green light, which is repeated in the catapult room. Final ready red light flashes on from the catapult room and is repeated top side. Fire from catapult control to machinery room. Suspension switch off, clear the panels. All control lights okay. And here's our boy Spoiler, right on a job. Pilots have manned the planes, the engines are warmed up, and are all set for flyaway takeoff. Wheel chocks are manned and plane captains are standing by to remove wing lines. Not enough wind, we'll catapult the planes. Aye. Stand by to launch planes by catapult. Stand by to launch planes by catapult. As the word to launch by catapult is passed, the catapult crew topside bring in the positioning chocks. These chocks help to align the plane quickly and properly. When the plane taxis down the guideline, it is stopped by the front wheel chock, which is keyholed into position and locked into the deck. The handling crews remove the bow rail. Part of the safety rail is cut away to prevent damage to the bridle catcher as it is carried over the bow. The bridle catcher retrieving unit is bolted into position. And the bridle catcher is placed across the catapult track to prevent loss of the bridle as the plane becomes airborne. Pullback units for the fighter and torpedo planes and rear positioning chocks are brought from the catwalk. This chalk assists the plane director in lining up the tail wheel with the catapult track. It is keyholed into position and locked with the after pin. The hold back and release unit is positioned and locked into the deck cleat at a predetermined mark. The safety boot is slipped down and a proper tension ring is inserted. The stop chalk is placed in position to prevent excessive forward motion of the plane. This shuttle is lifted from its concealed place in the track and the spreader is attached. Another type is larger and remains visible at all times. It is covered by a protection plate that prevents damage to wheels and tires. Shuttles are connected directly to the launching cable concealed in the catapult track. New and properly tested bridles of both sizes are available in the port catwalk. As the fighters are to be launched first, the proper bridle is placed over the shuttle ready for the number one plane. Positioning chocks are in place. Shuttle spreader is attached, hold back unit in place, bridle catcher in position, and the bow rail is down. 
All preparations have been made to receive the first aircraft. Plane directors pass the number one plane up the deck with the chalk men staying in close. As the plane approaches the guideline, the plane director angles it toward the front wheel positioning chart. This prevents the plane from overriding the center line of the catapult. The tail wheel hits the rear positioning chart and the plane is properly lined up fore and aft on the catapult. Tail wheel is locked, the plane is brought ahead easy, hold back and release unit is attached, as the front wheel hits the stop shock. Plane director signals hold brakes, stop shock is removed. Until the slack is taken up, the bridle must remain in this dangerous position for a final check of the bridle eye at the hook throat. The slack is taken out of the bridle and tension put on the hold back unit by forward motion of the shuttle, controlled at flight deck panel by the electric cable tensioner. The tension continues until the proper compression of the tension spring within the unit is reached. Tension ring is again checked and the leather safety boot is slipped into position. Final check by the bridleman at the catapult hook throat. Proper tension of the hold back unit. Slack taken up on the bridle and the first plane is in all respects ready for launching. The next plane is brought into the number one spot and made ready to be taxied onto the catapult. Only a sufficient number of planes are taxied toward the catapult to ensure no delay in launching. The check board is shown to the pilot of the first plane at the catapult as a final safety precaution prior to launching. Subsequent pilots make their final safety check from the board as the planes taxi into the number one spot. Doing this prior to reaching the proper catapult position speeds up operation. As the white light or first ready is flashed from a machinery room, the catapult officer signals all set for launching. Ready to launch aircraft, sir. To block the shapes. The ship steadies into the wind. Green flag. Warning horn, launch aircraft. Pilot gets quick one finger check. Nods okay, turns up to take off power. Stand by green lights in machinery room. Safety bolt out, final ready. Red light at control panel. Pilot gives final ready to dispatcher. Clear deck, fire. fighter is shot into the air. Immediately, a crewman leaves his safety position in the catwalk to retrieve the pendant from the bridal catcher. Hey, Mac, give me a bridle. 
the dope would hand up the wrong one. Out of the way, spoiler. By reversing the movement of the crosshead, shuttle moves back into the launching position. A new bridle is slipped over the shuttle, and another tension ring replaces the broken one from the last launching. As soon as the catapult is cleared, next plane moves up. Chalkman stays with the plane until the wheel hits the positioning chalk. The following plane moves into the one spot, where a pilot checks the mags and safety board. Other planes are left aft to facilitate respotting should a catapult breakdown occur, necessitating a flyaway takeoff. Hook release unit on. Tension is applied to the shuttle by the electric tensioner operated at the control station. Proper strain is applied to the tensioner spring within the unit. Slack is taken from the bridle, ensuring proper contact of bridle eye hook throat. Tension ring is checked. Safety boot slipped up. Arresting hook checked. Signals OK to director. Ready for launching. Catapult officer takes over and gives pilot one finger turn up. This has previously been done in the number one spot as pilot nods OK. And at number two turn up, he advances the throttle to full takeoff power. What do you do here, mate? Get out of here. Flight deck set. Pilot gives final ready. Launch the plane. Firing button is pressed and the plane starts down the deck. Repeater lights out, green light on, which is the signal from control to the machinery room to bring the shuttle back into launching position. Speed in catapulting the planes depends upon the teamwork of the catapult crews, plane directors, and the alertness of the pilot. Catapulting is relatively slower than a flyaway takeoff. However, a good team should be able to launch planes at a 45-second interval. Those chalkmen are really in there in case of an emergency. As the pilot gives a final OK, the plane is launched and the last fighter moves onto the catapult track. or improper positioning of the stop shock necessitates the use of the ready handling crew who are stationed at the island and are standing by to assist the plane director. In this case, the tail wheel did not line up. Last fighter is in position, turned up to rated takeoff power, and is launched. Alert crewmen begin changing the positioning chart for the torpedo planes, which are longer and have a wider landing gear. A larger and stronger holdback unit is made ready for the heavier and more powerful torpedo planes and placed in the slotted cleat at a predetermined mark. Stop truck is positioned. The first torpedo plane moves up with the following TBFs moving forward to keep an even flow of planes to the catapult. These truckmen are on their toes. As the plane is taxied down the guard line, they are ready for any emergency. As the plane nears the positioning chalk, bridlemen move in to attach the bridle to the catapult hooks of the plane. Stop chalk is removed. 
Bridle is attached, and tension is taken up as the shuttle moves forward. Proper tensioning complete, dispatcher takes over. First turn up signal is relayed to the plane crew who takes station. Plane gunners get set for launching. Pilot signals final ready. Fire. The ready plane is moving onto the catapult. Pilot has had the one finger turn up and check board in the number one spot. Tail wheel, bring it ahead easy, hold brakes, stop shock out, brakes off. Well, Spoiler finally has his mind on something, a gee dunk. Too bad he lost his G-dunk. It's a wonder he didn't lose his head. Let's get going. All okay? Fire! The crewman replaces the broken ring in the unit for the next plane. straightens the hold back connection fitting on the plane. This man must be alert and hooking the hold back unit on the plane as every second counts getting that plane into the air. Bridle ready and held until proper tension is applied. As on the fighter, proper compression of the tension spring is indicated as the sleeve reaches the red mark on the shaft. Tension ring okay, boot on. Resting hook locked up, all set. Deck clear, fire. Let's follow one clear through and see what an average interval can be. seconds, plane on a catapult. 23 seconds, pull back and release unit attached. Bridle on, stop chock full. Thirty-seven seconds, tension's taken up. Forty-one seconds, first turn up, final turn up. Launch the plane. 47 seconds is a fine interval. Every second counts in battle. Well done. As the last plane is launched, the area is cleared of all catapult gear. The bow rail is put up. The deck is made ready to land aircraft when they return from their mission. Successful catapulting on a carrier depends upon speed, precision, teamwork of the crew, and alertness of the pilots. A short launching interval may mean the difference between success or failure of an offensive strike against the enemy.
This was an airplane. Wings meant to fly, an engine, precision instruments, 10,000 man hours of labor. And now, it's junk. This was the pilot. Here, reduced to statistics, case records, and reports, is the history of airplanes destroyed, wasted, and far worse, of men killed or injured. Here are the scorecards of carelessness and ignorance, the case histories of the final mistakes of hundreds of pilots, some of them students, some with thousands of hours of flying time. In the two years following Pearl Harbor, many more Navy flyers were killed in accidents than were killed in air combat. Stalls and spins alone killed almost as many flyers as the enemy did. And accidental spins don't just happen. They are caused by pilots who forget what they have been taught. One, the steeper the bank or the sharper the pull-up, the higher the G. Two, the higher the G and the heavier the load, the higher the stalling speed. Three, keep flying speed always. The steeper the bank or the sharper the pull-up, the higher the G. One G is a force equal to the pull of gravity, the natural weight of anything when there is no other force applied. In a 2G turn or dive pullout, you experience a centrifugal or accelerative force, which causes you and your airplane to weigh just twice the normal weight. The steeper the bank or the sharper the pull-up, the higher the G. The higher the G and the heavier the load, the higher the stalling speed. In any maneuver, the stalling speed of an airplane increases according to the square root of the applied G. Thus, an airplane that stalls at an airspeed of 70 knots in level flight, 1G, will stall at 140 knots in a 4G turn or pullout. And remember, the heavier the airplane is loaded, the higher the wing loadings and therefore, the higher the stalling speed. Any airplane will stall when the airspeed falls below that required for the given attitude of flight. Keep flying speed always. The record cards show that more than one half of all stall spin accidents occur in landing approaches. Classification D1 covers spin accidents during normal landing approach. Here is a case history. This pilot was on the crosswind leg of his approach to the field. He turned too late and found himself overshooting the runway. He tried to line himself up with the runway by means of a 50 degree bank turn. His airspeed was 90 knots and he should have had at least 10 knots more at that angle of bank. Midway in the turn, the airplane fell off into a spin. The cause of this crash was poor judgment. The pilot made too violent a turn too slow. When he found himself overshooting the groove, he should have gone around again. Classification D2 covers landing approaches, carrier and field carrier. While engaged in carrier landing qualification, this pilot came into the groove without sufficient power setting and losing altitude. When given a low signal, he pulled his nose up without adding throttle, and in so doing, he lost flying speed. The plane fell off on its left wing. The airplane was demolished. The pilot was seriously injured. The pilot probably owes his life to the fact that his shoulder harness was properly secured. Another pilot, returning from a mission, made a slow gliding approach. A landing signal officer picked him up with a roger. 
But as the pilot continued to settle in a flat attitude, progressed to a low and come on. Upon receiving wave off from the signal officer, the pilot jammed on full gun. That airplane crashed the deck. Why? Because it was trimmed for landing at reduced power. When the throttle was applied, the pilot failed to compensate for the additional power, prop blast, and torque. The common causes of spins in landing approaches are flying too slow on one of the approach legs, making excessively steep turns, or hitting the slipstream from another airplane. The next case history covers a spin accident involving a PV with a crew of six. No survivors. According to witnesses, the airplane was in a steep left turn at about 400 feet and at low airspeed when it stalled and spun to the left. The aircraft entered the water in a shallow inverted dive. It sank immediately. According to analyses, most spins following takeoff are caused by two steep climbs and climbing turns or getting into slipstream. This pilot made a normal takeoff but entered a steep climb out of the field. At about 400 feet altitude, he started a turn. At this moment, he was seen to enter a spin. He crashed near the edge of the field. In the opinion of the board, this fatal accident was due to the poor judgment and technique of the pilot in attempting a steep turn at low altitude and near stalling speed. The next classification covers spin accidents occurring during simulated emergencies and small field practice. In these accidents, Navy flight instructors were involved. Anyone can get into a spin anytime he gets careless of the speed or attitude of his airplane. There's no mystery about spins. All pilots know what causes them. They should know how to avoid them and they must know how to recover from stalls and spins if they want to keep their health. But above and beyond all that, it's a matter of constant mental alertness, of staying on your toes. Here's the case history of an instructor who had all the answers, but didn't get the word. This instructor and student were on an authorized B-stage flight. On leaving the pylons, the instructor gave the student a simulated emergency, downwind at low altitude. The student attempted a steep turn into the wind. He wrapped the airplane up till she stalled and entered a spin. The instructor took over the controls, but due to insufficient altitude was unable to recover. Clear back into your lap. Don't try to pull the stick out of its socket as you're likely to do if your safety belt is loose. In an inverted spin, look over the nose of the airplane. If you let your head get thrown back so you're looking straight down at the ground, there's a tendency to confuse the direction of rotation. Remember, your turn indicator always shows the true direction of rotation. In the long run, avoiding a spin accident is a matter of avoiding sloppy flying, a matter of knowing what to do and doing it properly. Our files are full of pilots who either didn't know what to do or who forgot. So get the word. Fly smart. Quit stalling and stay out of our files. Don't become a statistic. are inclined to be dull and tedious. Consequently, many flyers try to relieve the monotony. 
On an area familiarization flight, for example, pilots have been known to become too familiar with the area. Now this young man isn't psychopathic. So why does he act that way? Let's go back a few years and see what makes him tick. As a child, Murphy was just an ordinary, fun-loving youngster. No indications of present or potential neuroses. His behavior pattern was perfectly normal with the usual tendencies toward exhibitionism. But he possessed a natural desire for preeminence. Like most children, he made no attempt to restrain his impulses. He evidenced manifestations of a drive towards self-destruction. Also an assertion of ego, which by inversion led him to destroy other things. Simply a matter of ambivalence. But as he grew older, the society in which he lived imposed upon him its controls and conventions. He learned to restrain his impulses. Not that society curtailed his animal spirit. It simply directed them into more acceptable channels. So that when he joined the Navy, he was able to comply generally with regulations set down for a Navy flyer. And now, an officer and a gentleman, he accepts the totems and taboos of civilization. He wouldn't think of doing this. Or this or this. He behaves himself. Of course, when he's completely alone, he has his moments like the rest of us. But he isn't alone most of the time. In the group, he's a fine formation flyer. He knows radio discipline. He's an owl at night flying. In fact, whenever an operation involves group responsibility, Murph gets a big bang out of sharing the burden. But when he's alone, all alone, he feels free from the restrictions of the group. And on a monotonous assignment, his feeling of release is aggravated by boredom. Soon that old black magic is massaging his spine. That drive towards self-assertion. Murphy's reward will be for this display of virtuosity. This? 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 No. Murphy's a big boy now. That was his last flight. Set Ensign Rx Murphy to deviate from such course. Therein and thereby endangering the lives and property of the inhabitants in the area. The specification proved and that the said Ensign Murphy is of the charge guilty. The court therefore sentences him to be dismissed from the U.S. Naval Service. <laughs>